Okay, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, we have Natasha Crooks with us today. Uh, Natasha is from Cornell and UT and many other places, <laughs> including Paris and uh, England. Um, uh, she is going to talk to us about her work on uh, transactional storage systems. And uh, the first time I met Natasha, we are now the founding members of the uh, OSDI uh, Distributed Transactions Fan Club, which is how she ran into me and Adriana while we were talking about how much we love distributed transactions. And so this is very much keeping in, in line with uh, what I know about Natasha. So, yeah. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I'm really happy to be here. As Irene said, I'm a PhD student at Texas and a visiting student at Cornell, so my Texas PhD mostly consists of me shoveling snow. But what I'm going to try and do today is, um, using my research in distributed systems and in databases, is to try and convince you that placing applications at the center of how we reason about um, systems is key to improving both the performance and the semantics of transactional data stores. And what I mean by transactional data stores are key value stores or databases that support transactions. So I guess the first question that I should answer is, why should you care about transactional data stores in the first place? Well, you should care because they're the software that allow applications to store data. And data is everywhere. Medical records are being placed online for better interoperability. Factories are placing sensors on machine parts to predict when they have to be replaced. And even your local baker is at it, and is tracking customer food purchases to minimize food wastage. So what's interesting here, or at least what I find interesting, is that the people designing these applications are usually highly trained domain experts, but they're not necessarily computer scientists. It may come as a surprise to you, but your local baker probably does not know much about distributed systems or Paxos. But in that ecosystem, um, applications need software solutions to store that data. So this is where the magic or the promise of the cloud comes in. The cloud basically promises simplicity. It offers managed solutions to collect and store data that require little technical expertise. And the way that I like to think about cloud storage systems is that they provide the abstraction of a fader-free black box that will scale as much as one's wallet will allow. In that ecosystem, applications usually interact with a front end that acts as a valve, shielding applications from the complexity of distribution and scalability. Now, this all probably seems fairly obvious to you, but the point that I want to highlight here is that because of this valve, applications only interact with the state of the system through the reason they execute. And more generally, the fact that the cloud is a black box from the perspective of the application means that applications can only observe the external state of the system, not any of the system internals. And that has a number of consequences, both positive and negative. So on the one hand, it introduces new challenges. The correctness guarantees of data stores, and I'll define correctness precisely later, are usually defined in terms of low-level constructs like operation ordering or timestamps that are no longer visible to applications in this black box model. On the other, not observing the internal state of the system actually brings opportunities. Specifically, it offers additional flexibility for implementation. And this is because the state of an individual component in the data stores no longer needs to be correct, as long as the external state appears correct um, or appears indistinguishable from a state that is correct to applications. So to both address these challenges and to size these opportunities, what I've argued over the course of my PhD is that one should take a client-centric view to system development. And what I mean by client-centric is this. Correctness guarantees today are currently expressed bottom-up, starting from the systems that implement these guarantees. Instead, I think that they should be implemented top-down, starting from the applications that observe these guarantees. And while taking a client-centric shift might seem like a fairly minor, sorry, a client-centric approach might seem like a fairly minor shift, it actually brings several uh, significant benefits. First, is what allowed my co-authors and I to reformulate correctness guarantees cleanly and succinctly. It's what allowed us to improve the performance and the semantics of conflict handling and causal consistency, which is a popular correctness guarantee. And finally, and this was maybe the most surprising to me, it's what allowed us to design the first system to support private serizable transactions with reasonable overhead. So what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is to try and share with you some of my enthusiasm for this approach. And to do so, I'm going to first focus on how this approach can improve our understanding of correctness in transactional data stores. And then I'll then discuss some of the secu surprising security benefit that this approach enables. So in a nutshell, what I'm going to try and convince you of first 
is the correctness definitions today are client-centric, system-centric, sorry. They rely on properties like version ordering or timestamps that are not visible to applications. Instead, I think that a better way to express correctness guarantees is to express correctness guarantees in terms of the states the clients directly observe. Now, I'm hopefully going to convince you that this makes it easier to compare and relate different correctness guarantees. So like I said in the start of my talk, my work specifically targets uh, transactional data stores. So before I begin, I just want to briefly um, specify what I mean by a transaction. So a transaction is a grouping of operations that take effect atomically. So either all of the effects take, um, all the actions take effect or none do. Now just to clarify notation, if you look at uh, the example on this slide, you have a transaction that reads object X and writes object Y. Just to clarify notation, S and C here denote respectively the start and the end of the transaction. Um, and Y1 here refers to the first version of object Y. So in general, transactions are pretty nice. They're a popular feature of most database systems as they uh, significantly simplify program development because they allow developers to um, access multiple objects as a single atomic unit. Correctness then in the context of transactions usually refers to a notion called isolation. Now for performance, modern databases usually allow transactions to execute concurrently. So isolation then defines a contract that regulates the interaction between concurrently executing transactions. And the gold standard for isolation in, in database systems is a notion called serizability. Now what serizability says is that even though transactions might be executing concurrently for performance, the overall execution should remain equivalent to an execution in which all transactions are executing uh, one at a time. So if you look at the example on the slide here, you have two transactions, T1 in blue and T2 in red. Now T1 writes object X and Y, and T2 reads uh, T1's right. Now this execution is serizable as it can be reordered so that T1 executes fully before T2. And in general, serizability is appealing as it provides ap uh, the applications with the illusion that they are executing in isolation without concurrency. Unfortunately, it's also um, expensive as it requires extensive coordination between concurrently executing transactions and rarely scales under heavy contention. So because of these performance concerns, many databases actually relax the isolation guarantee that they provide to application. This is something called weak isolation. And for those of you who know my advisor, he really likes motorcycles. And I tend to think of weak isolation in much the same way. So on the one hand, isolation guarantees, weak isolation guarantees are fast. They rely on, um, they relax the amount of coordination um, between concurrently executing transactions, which allows for better scalability and performance. The other way to say it is that they um, allow more transactions to execute concurrently, which improves throughput. The flip side is that they're dangerous. They're very tricky to reason about because they allow for non serizable behaviors that can break application logic. So they make the programming overhead significantly harder. And so these notions of anomalies, which are non serizable behaviors, um, can be quite complex. So just to give you an intuition for what they look like, I'm going to run through the example of something called write skew, which is one of the most well-known types of anomalies. And write skew can break um, application invariance. So to illustrate, let's consider Alice and Bob, the share of checkings and savings account, and can withdraw money from either as long as the joint balance is not negative. And let's assume that they both try to withdraw $50, respectively from the checkings and from the savings account. So to do so, they're going to start a transaction that is going to read the checkings and savings account. Now Alice sees that checkings is 30 and savings is 30, sees that the sum is 60, and so withdraws $50 from the checking account. Now Bob is going to do the same. He also saw that the checkings and the savings were 30, the value, and so he's going to withdraw money from the savings account. Whoops. The invariant that the checking and the savings account, the sum of them, should be greater than zero is now broken. Now the reason why this happens is that Alice missed Bob's update and Bob missed Alice's update. So this execution is clearly not serizable, but it is perfectly valid under several weak isolation guarantees. And this matters. So a recent paper in the flagship database conference, Sigma 2017, actually leveraged similar types of anomalies to break commercial applications running under some of the most popular e-commerce frameworks. Specifically, they were able to spend the same voucher um, infinitely many times. And I'd like to mention they don't mention in the paper what they did with what they bought. Um, but in spite of these challenges and be because of the performance concern, weak isolation is popular. 
So some of those most popular commercial databases out there actually um, offer as default a guarantee that is strictly weaker than serizability. And in fact, the ones I'm highlighting here don't offer serizability at all. So because of this popularity, there's been a long quest to try and formalize weak isolation guarantee. And this started very early on. This started in 1977 with a seminal paper by James Gray, who formalized weak isolation guarantees in terms of locks that transactions had to acquire before accessing shared data. In 1992, the anti-SQL specification then tried to refine uh, those definitions to allow for non-lock-based implementations. Unfortunately, the informal definitions they provided turned out to be ambiguous, which led to some of the work by uh, Phil, Berenson here and Hal Phil Bernstein and Hal Berenson here on providing the first formal treatment of anti-SQL. Unfortunately, the um, specific definitions they provided still disallow for certain optimistic implementations of weak isolation which is what the work of uh, Atul Adya and uh, Barbara Liskov uh, tried to address. They tried to provide the first generic specification of isolation that would allow for more optimistic implementations, or more aggressive implementation. Now, I'd like to preface something here. I think that the work by Atul Adya and Barbara Liskov is absolutely fantastic, so much so that I had his thesis on my bedside table for many years. Um, but in the context of cloud storage systems, I do think that this work has some limitations. And just to highlight what those limitations are, I'm going to spend the next couple of slides actually um, highlighting what, um, what the framework does. So at its core, um, Adya's framework associates version order and timestamps with the notion of a serialization graph. So a serialization graph is a graph where nodes represent committed transactions and edges different relationship between transactions. So a right read edge, for instance, denotes a transaction T2 reading a transaction T1's right. A read-write edge denotes a transaction T2 missing T3's right, so reading the version that precedes um, a write of T3. A write-write edge denotes a transaction um, T4 overwriting T3's right. And finally, a start edge denotes a transaction um, T3 committing before transaction T5 starts. Isolation then becomes uh, defined as preventing specific types of cycles on that graph. So when you look at serializability, things are pretty straightforward. Serializability is defined as preventing all types of cycles, and that's it. When you start looking at weak isolation levels, however, things get more complex. And to illustrate just quite how complex they can get, I'm just going to intuitively motivate, um, formal, sorry, um, a definition called snapshot isolation. And I'm just going to in, um, informally specify it. I, so snapshot isolation is one of the most uh, popular isolation guarantees out there because it provides much of the benefit of serializability, but allows read operations to proceed concurrently with write operations. So informally, snapshot isolation has two requirements. First, it requires the transactions read from a committed snapshot of the system. So you can think of it as taking a picture of the database at a given point in time and reading from that picture. The second requirement is that concurrent transactions should not update the same object. So hopefully the informal definition is pretty uh, simple to understand. Once you start looking at its formalization, however, things get more complicated. This is how um, Arja formalizes it. It prevents three things. Cycles consisting of write-write or write-read edges. Cycles consisting of write-write or write-read edges with a single backpointing read-write edge. And finally, any write-write or write-read edge that doesn't also have a start edge. So as you can probably tell by the speed at which I'm going, I don't expect you to fully understand this. Instead, what I want you to take out of this slide is this is fairly complex. And it's unlikely to allow your tech-savvy baker to understand why a snapshot isolation allows an anomaly like write skew, for instance. And the second point that I want to mention is that if you remember, I defined snapshot isolation informally as reading from a snapshot. It's fairly hard to understand the informal read from a snapshot idea and align it to this cycle-based approach. So there's a disconnect. And the problem with that disconnect is the formalism drives what people think. So if that's your definition, then you're going to think of isolation in terms of low-level constructs like operation ordering or timestamps. So it shouldn't be surprising to, to you that this has led to many definitions of snapshot is of isolation that all vary in subtle ways. For instance, there's no less than eight variants of snapshot isolation. And the problem is that the ways in which these different flavors of isolation differ is very system-specific. It depends on properties like 
timestamp assignment, or whether the system stores a single copy or multiple copies of every object in the system, or the number of replicas. And this matters. So Oracle 18C is, one, is a popular cloud-based database out there and claims to be serizable. However, the precise definition of serizability that it uses implicitly assumes that there is a single copy of every object in the system. As you might be guessing, Oracle 18C stores multiple copies. And so despite claiming to be serizable, it actually admits non-serizable executions. And this is where the supposed simplicity of cloud storage really comes to bite. The bread and butter of cloud storage services is to hide these implementation details. But these implementation details today are actually necessary to understand the high-level semantics that weak isolation guarantees provide you. And this is precisely the problem. I think there's a fundamental gap between how isolation guarantees are formally defined and the way in which they are used or understood. So on the one hand, um, isolation guarantees are defined in terms of low-level constructs like operation ordering or time stance. Like as we've seen, this logic is invisible to the application and can lead to system-specific definitions. On the other, applications perceive the database as a black box whose state they only get to see through the reads that they execute. So this is why I believe a client-centric approach can help. Like I said, applications only observe the state of the system through the reads that they execute. So I'm going to do the same. I'm going to propose a model that directly expresses isolation guarantees in terms of what applications actually read. And to do so, I'm going to create a new notion. I'm going to introduce a new notion, that of read states. So read states characterize the possible states in which the storage system could have been in based on what the transactions actually read. I'm then going to use those read states as part of a per-transaction commit test that is going to constrain um, whether a transaction's observation are consistent with a particular isolation level. Now, because read states summarize what the application saw, there's no longer any need to peek inside the black box. So because read states are so sort of inherent to our model, I just want to spend a, little, uh, a bit of time uh, giving you an example of what they actually are. So let's consider two operations, a read of y and a read of z. And let's consider a storage system that contains two objects, y and z. And the circles here denote possible storage system states. So the red operation reads version Z1 of object Z. So I'm going to say that it has two candidate read states, which I'm highlighting here in red. And these correspond to the states that contain version Z1 of object Z. Now what's important to highlight here is that from the point of view of the red operation, these two states are indistinguishable, as the red operation only sees object Z. It doesn't look at object Y. The blue operation, on the other hand, reads version Y0 of object Y. So we're going to say that it has a single candidate read state, as there's a single state that contains version Y0 of object Y. So there's no ambiguity. Now, using these notions of read states and commit test, we can then define isolation guarantees as follows. A storage system guarantees a specific isolation level I if it can generate an execution that is a sequence of atomic state transitions. So if you look on the slide here, the arrows denote the effect of applying a transaction to a state and the resulting transition. If it can generate an execution that satisfies the commit test I for every transaction T. Now the challenge obviously becomes what is the commit test for a given isolation level? So for the purpose of this talk, I'm only going to look at serializability and snapshot isolation. But we do have definitions for all um, existing isolation guarantees and proofs that they're equivalent to their system-centric counterpart. So to go ahead and define a serizability and snapshot isolation, I just need to define two more notions. The first one is a parent state. So a parent state is a state that precedes the state that a transaction creates. So if you look at the example here, if you look at transaction T3, the parent state of T3 will be the state I'm highlighting here in red, as is the state that precedes the state that T3 created. <coughs> the next notion that I need to define is the idea of a complete state. Now, a complete state is a state that is a valid read state for all operations in the transaction. What this is intuitively saying is that all operations in the transaction could have read from the same state. So if you look at the example, and if you look at a transaction T that contains two operations, um, a read of Z and a read of Y, the first operation has two read states, which I'm highlighting here in blue. The second operation has a single read state, which I'm highlighting here in red. 
that read state would be a complete state for T because both operations can read from it. So using these notions of parent states and complete states, we can then go ahead and define serializability and snapshot isolation. So does anyone have any questions about these two definitions before I move on? Yes. Is the parent state the immediately preceding state, or is it any state that? Uh, immediately preceding state. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if we look at serializability and snapshot isolation, now one thing that I like about this model is it makes it fairly easier to compare and contrast these two guarantees. So if you look at serializability, serializability says um, that the parent state of a transaction T should be complete. Now, what this is intuitively saying is that a transaction can read from the same state that it commits from. And so nothing happened in between. If you recall the intuitive definition of serializability, which says that it should be equivalent to um, every transaction executing um, in sequence, this is what they're saying, that nothing happened between my read and my commit. If we look at snapshot isolation, then, well, one thing that snapshot isolation does is preserves the requirement that there should be a complete state, but relaxes it to say that it can be any state, not just the parent state. So you can read from any state in the past. It also requires that concurrent transactions should not update the same object. Now, if I flip back to the system-centric definition of snapshot isolation, there's a couple of points that I want to make. First, the definition that we rely on here um, completely removes the notion of a timestamp. In contrast, if you look at the system-centric approach, this required the use of a start edge. The second point that I want to emphasize, and I hope you'll agree with me, is that if you remember, I defined snapshot isolation informally as reading from a snapshot. I hope that the idea of a complete state maps more intuitively to our notion of reading from a snapshot than the cycle-based approach that's based on read and write operations. So this is what I find nice about this model. Expressing isolation guarantees in a client-centric way actually makes it fairly easy to separate high-level guarantees from low-level implementation details. And that makes it easier to compare and relate different isolation guarantees. So you might remember that I said there existed no less than eight variants of snapshot isolation. Well, here they are. So there's no need to worry too much about the acronym soup on this slide. The point that matters here is that these different flavors of isolation differ in how they compute um, snapshots, so how they assign timestamp. Now, it turns out that once you remove implementation details, like our model does, several of these isolation guarantees that people thought uh, to dis were distinct actually turn out to be equivalent. And we're able to prove that. On the other hand, when these low-level implementation details do impact high-level semantics, our model is still sufficiently expressive to capture their differences. And so we're able to use these two features to systematize snapshot isolation variants and derive the first clean hierarchy of these guarantees. So if you identify the right abstraction, um, it should have some semantic benefits. And hopefully what I've just done is to try and convince you that there is some amount of semantic benefit that can be gained by expressing isolation in a client-centric way. But I would argue that the right abstraction should um, have some performance benefit as well. And this is what I'm going to try and convince you of next that a client-centric approach to system design can actually be the key to enabling good performance. So before I move on, does anyone have any questions about the um, isolation framework? All right. So the reason for why I believe that a client-centric approach can bring better performance is the following. A client-centric approach to enforcing correctness actually brings um, more flexibility to implementations because it allows implementations to cheat. So a, um, a system-centric um, way of defining correctness requires that every component of the data store implement um, a particular correctness guarantee for whatever definition of correctness you might want. In contrast, a client-centric definition only requires that applications observe a correct data store, or state that is indistinguishable um, from a correct data store. So I've applied this idea uh, a couple of times over the course of my PhD. But the one that I want to focus on here, because I think is the most interesting to me, is this idea's application to security. So the rest of this talk is very much going to still be about a uh, client-centric approach to transactional processing, but the domain is going to be slightly different. So there's going to be a slight change of pace just to warn you. So in a nutshell, allowing the system to cheat 
is what allowed us to design the first system to support um, oblivious serializable transactions. And what I mean by that is to design a cloud-based data store that supports serializable transactions while also hiding from the cloud access patterns. And what I mean by access patterns are hiding what data is being accessed, so what object, when that data is being accessed, so how frequently, and how that data is being accessed, so whether it's a read or a write operation. And um, the sort of core idea that allowed us to do that was the following. Traditional definitions of serializability state that serializability should only apply when a transaction commits. It only holds for committed transactions. We reformulated that in a client-centric way to say the serializability should only be enforced when clients observe that a transaction has committed. Because that's the only time where they get to see that a transaction has committed. And what I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is try to um, explain how this reformulation of um, serializability is what allowed us to support concurrent serializable transactions, is what allowed us to guarantee durability, specifically how to preserve the effects of transactions across failures, and finally, is also what allowed us to amortize the overheads of guaranteeing obliviousness across many concurrent requests. But before I begin, I just want to briefly motivate why this is a useful problem to tackle in the first place and why you might want to hide access patterns. And the reason for why you might want to hide access patterns is that um, applications store sensitive information. And so moving that information to the cloud means that you're now trusting an untrusted third party with things like um, social security numbers or um, health information. Now, the obvious way to sidestep this is to use encryption. And most cloud storage systems do provide a form of encryption at rest. But encryption is often not sufficient. The very fact that an oncologist is accessing a particular record may reveal that a patient has cancer, while the frequency at which that record is being accessed may reveal both the type and the severity of the cancer. And this is because chemotherapy appointments actually have a very specific schedule to them that is very unique to the specific cancer types and specific stages of cancer. So in order to protect um, uh, sensitive information, it is at least desirable to hide metadata about how you're accessing the, the records, not just the content of the records. And we're going to do that in a setup that mirrors uh, the cloud storage uh, black box uh, approach that I've been uh, talking about. And we're going to call this the trusted proxy model. So like the name says, this model assumes a trusted centralized proxy through which clients communicate with an untrusted cloud storage. So you can think of it as a set of doctors um, talking to a, a server on the hospital um, local area network, but storing uh, data on a service like um, Amazon or Azure um, over the wide area. Now, we're also going to make the more realistic assumption, and we're going to extend prior work in doing so, that um, clients in the, the clients in the proxy can fail, but the cloud storage is reliable. So you can think of it as a doctor tripping over the power cord um, of the servers of the hospital's basement, but having many smart engineers um, provide the abstraction of reliable cloud storage. And the system that we're going to design, Obladi, is going to main oblivious, maintain obliviousness by religiously maintaining one invariant, that of workload independence. And what workload independence says is that the request pattern sent to the untrusted cloud uh, must remain completely independent of the workload, of any concurrently executing transactions. And what this does is that the cloud storage will learn, never learn any information about the request simply by observing the reason why they're being executed on the cloud, because there's no correlation between those requests and the actual workload. So the challenge becomes, how can we guarantee workload independence in the presence of transactions? So, and in essence, out of that call, transactions are basically uh, a bunch of read and writes. So we're going to take as a starting point a protocol that guarantees workload independence and hides access patterns for reads and writes. And that's oblivious RAM, or ORAM. And at its core, the way that ORAM ensures workload independence is basically by making all requests to cloud storage look completely random. So because they're random, or they appear random, they're completely independent of the workload. Now, there's been a large body of work on ORAM constructions, and I don't claim to be able to summarize them all here. But I just want to give you the intuition uh, for how they guarantee workload independence. So at the very, at the very highest level of abstraction, an ORAM construction takes logical read and write operations, so the ones that the client executes, and generates a set of physical reads and writes to cloud storage, 
such that the physical location of objects on the cloud remains hidden. So to achieve this, the proxy is going to hide requests for real data among requests for dummy data. As the data is encrypted, the cloud storage cannot distinguish which requests are for real data and which requests are for dummy data, and consequently learns no information about the requests. Now, obviously, this is at the very highest level of abstraction, and the, there's many, um, many, uh, much research in uh, the subtleties of guaranteeing workload independence given this broad context. But hopefully, this gives you an intuition. And at the very highest level of abstraction, this is sufficient to guarantee workload independence for reads and writes. But when you start looking at transactions, however, there's several new challenges that emerge. The first one was how do you guarantee isolation if you're trying to execute concurrent transactions? Specifically, how do you do concurrency control? The second challenge is how do you guarantee durability? And the specific problem here is that durability requires a very specific ordering of rights for, uh, for consistency, while the ORAM requires an equally specific but different ordering of rights for security. And finally, how do you guarantee good performance when most ORAM constructions afford only limited concurrency. So like I've hinted at the start of my talk, we're going to answer these questions by relying on a simple principle, that of delayed visibility. Now, delayed visibility embraces the client-centric approach that I've been advocating. It recognizes that serializability guarantees must only be enforced when a client observes that a transaction has committed, but makes the additional observation that commit operations can be delayed. And we're going to use this observation to partition the system into fixed time, fixed size epochs and delay commit notifications until the end of the epoch, until the end of each epoch. Now, because serizability must only be enforced for um, transactions that the client sees as committed, delaying commit notifications until the end of the epoch means that we're only required to enforce consistency and durability at epoch boundaries only because epoch boundaries are the only point at which a client will get to see that his transaction is committed. Now, because, we can, um, because we're only enforcing um, consistency at epoch boundaries, writes don't have to be durable until the end of the epoch. And this actually allows us to execute transactions at the trusted proxy, which is not reliable, and buffer intermediate versions of each write in a version cache until the end of the epoch. Again, we can do that because the only point at which we have to guarantee durability is epoch boundaries. Now, this approach actually has two benefits that help improve performance. First, it's going to reduce the number of requests that we have to send to the ORAM. And this is because as we only guarantee durability at epoch boundaries, it is sufficient to write the last version of every key only to cloud storage and skip all the intermediate versions. So if you look at the example, you have two versions of B that have been written um, in a version cache over the course of an epoch. It is sufficient to write the last version of B only, skipping the red version, because that red version does not need to be made durable. The second benefit that comes from um, buffering intermediate writes is the ability to implement a multi-version serizable concurrency control on top of a single version ORAM. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, multi-version concurrency control allows read-only transact, read operations to proceed concurrently with write operations. And so this allows us to significantly speed up read-only transactions. And for those of you interested, uh, we chose an algorithm called um, multi-version timestamp ordering. Sorry, yeah. So the assumption here is that there's a single proxy in front of the cloud, and all of the doctors that will ever interact will, will talk to the same proxy. Yes, which has some scalability problems, as you hint, are hinting at. <coughs> Distributing the proxy um, actually introduces two challenges. One is, obviously, you have to do distributed transactions, but that can be done relatively efficiently. The main challenge is that the communication between those two um, copies of the proxy uh, needs to be um, oblivious as well. And so if the network is untrusted between the two proxy, that's actually an open question. If the network is trusted, the proxy could be decentralized relatively efficiently. So the choice of concurrency control is actually quite important. Um, we want to ensure that delaying commit notifications does not increase contention. Likewise, we want to ensure that um, transactions within the same epoch can actually see each other's effects. For instance, we want the um, read of the dark blue transaction to see the effect of the um, red transaction. 
the right of the red transaction. So to enable this, we actually chose a concurrency control that optimistically exposes uncommitted rights and aborts a risibility violation at commit time. And again, the reason why we can do this is because um, we only need to guarantee consistency at epoch boundaries only. And that's why we chose a multi-version timestamp ordering. So this is all I'm going to say from the performance side. One thing that I like about epochs and delayed visibility is that while epochs improve performance through increasing flexibility, it is the rigid and deterministic structure of epoch that actually helps or body guarantee workload independence. So the system is such that the cloud storage will always see the same sequence of read operations followed by a set of buffered writes, adding padding if necessary to keep the epoch size constant. And so there's no correlation between what um, the, system, the clients are actually executing and the, same, the, the number of reads and the frequency of reads and writes that the storage system will see. Now, these reads and writes then eventually have to be executed by the ORAM. And the challenge here is that ORAM constructions afford only limited concurrency, whereas the nature of the applications that we target requires sustaining a high load of concurrent requests. So we must somehow parallelize the construction. And there's two challenges here. The first one is that we obviously want our parallelization to remain correct. Specifically, we want our construction to be linearizable. And what I mean by linearizable is that um, the sequence of reads and writes that we execute in the parallel construction should return the same values they would have done in the sequential implementation. The second requirement is that we want our parallelization to be secure. So we want our parallelization to remain workload independent. And to understand why this is actually quite challenging, let me just remind you that an ORAM implementation takes a logical operation and generates a set of physical reads and writes to cloud storage, so that some operations access real data and others access dummy data. Now, in general, linearizability says that we can execute um, non-conflicting operations concurrently, <coughs> but requires that operations that exhibit data dependencies be executed sequentially. For instance, the um, write of the red object here should wait for the read of that same red object to finish. Now, it turns out that waiting for these data dependencies to be satisfied actually introduces timing channels. The red write must wait for the red read to finish, but does not need to wait for the dummy read to finish. So the class storage could um, use this difference in behavior to infer the position of real blocks by selectively delaying reads and observing whether writes are correspondingly delayed. So the obvious way to address this issue is to wait for all potential data dependencies to be satisfied before executing a write. Unfortunately, um, any block can contain real data. And so there, there can exist any pot potential de de data dependencies between any pairs of reads and writes. The long story short is there is never secure to execute reads and writes in parallel. So we took this as a lemon and made lemonade. We again leveraged the flexibility provided by delayed visibility to delay class storage writes until the end of the epoch. Now we can do this because again, the ORAM only needs to be consistent and durable at epoch boundaries. So it's perfectly okay to delay the class storage writes until the end of the epoch. Now delaying writes in this way allows us to partition the ORAM into a read phase and a write phase, where all reads um, are executed in parallel and all writes are executed in parallel. But what this does is impose a fixed structure between all reads and all writes that obscures all the data dependencies. It still allows for high concurrency, though, because all the reads are executed in parallel and all the writes are executed in parallel, which is the goal that we set out to accomplish. So this is what I'm going to say about Obladi, uh, about, sorry, about this particular implementation. I'm going to just mention that we do have a, a formal proof of security and that we were able to guarantee durability in the presence of proxy failures, but I won't discuss it in this talk. And so what I'll do is move on to the evaluation and ask the question, what is the cost of guaranteeing obliviousness? And to answer this question, we looked at three applications. TPCC and SmallBank, which are two uh, standard transaction processing benchmarks that simulate rough, roughly a um, shopping card application and a small banking application. And Free Health, which is a port of a real, real French medical record application. And we evaluated the system against two baselines. NoPriv, which is a um, system that shares the same concurrency control logic of a body, but no epochs. And uh, MySQL inodb, which is a multi-version serializable database. And we um, um, implemented a 10 millisecond latency between the proxy and the cloud storage 
as this is a latency that I see when I access a EC2 from Ithaca. So the first point I want to look at is throughput. Now, if we look at throughput for the three applications in transactions per second, and here higher is better, what we see is that throughput um, is, Obladi's throughput is reasonable. It suffers from a 5 to 7x, um, 5 to 9x, sorry, throughput drop on the two contention bottleneck free health and TPCC uh, applications, and up to 12x lower throughput on the resource bottleneck small bank applications. Now, obviously, this is still a significant performance slowdown. So I just want to give a little bit more context. Small bank here has uh, sustains a tr uh, throughput of 2,000 transactions per second. So if you're a glass half full kind of person, this is about the same order of magnitude as the visa processing system's average throughput, which is about 2,000 transactions per second. If you're a glass half empty kind of person, this is still a long ways away from the visa processing system's peak throughput, which is 56,000 transactions per second. The point that I want to emphasize here, though, is that the reason why we're able to achieve even close to reasonable throughput is because delayed visibility is what allows us to both paralyze the construction and amortize um, the cost of executing requests, or RAM requests, over many concurrent requests. So without delayed visibility, the raw throughput that we were able to achieve was six transactions per second. Now, obviously, this comes at a cost. Namely, if you're partitioning the system into epochs, you're going to increase latency. So if we look at the latency numbers in milliseconds for the three applications, uh, and here lower is better, we see a 70x increase in latency for TPCC and a smaller 70 to 20x increase for free health and small bank. And this is because, yeah, sorry. What is, what is the absolute magnitude of the latency here? How big are the epochs? Like um, so here you're seeing... Uh, I'm sorry? In, in this workload, for example. Here the, um, you're seeing uh, the... Oh, sorry, that's been a second, but... So the um, latency, the average latency for TPCC is, a, is in the hundreds of milliseconds here. So the cost of executing epoch is about 340 millisecond. And is that correlated? I mean, you have a parameter you control in the system, yes. which is the epoch size. Yes. How are you choosing that parameter? I guess um, if you wait for the next slide, Sorry. I'll answer that question. Okay. Fine. <laughs> um, so the reason why TPCC suffers from a higher uh, latency than the other two applications is because the epoch it has many more writes than the other two applications, and as a result, we need to configure a larger epoch size, which is more costly. Um, but to answer your question. If we now look at a graph that has the um, epoch size in millisecond and the resulting throughput for a fixed number of clients, what you see is two things. An epoch that is too short causes transactions to repeatedly abort, which kills throughput. While an epoch that is too long causes unnecessary idle time, causing throughput to taper off to the right side of the graph. So for instance, if you look at small bank, small bank is going to increase fairly sharply until about 50 millisecond. Um, and the reason for why that is is the transactions in small bank are pretty much all identical or well, they have similar size. So either all transactions can commit or none can. If you look at TPCC, however, which is the, the, blue, uh, sorry, the red line on the graph, um, TPCC is transactions that come in all shapes and sizes. And so the shorter transactions start being able to commit first uh, before the longer ones, which is why the increase is much softer. Presumably you can't tune that adaptively because if you did, it would be a side channel. If you adjusted the epoch size based on queries or the load, you would, you, you would violate the security problem. So what we do is fix an epoch size and uh, leak the information of an epoch size. Now, this has two impacts. One, you're right that it might allow you to distinguish whether you're running a, free, uh, a medical application or an e-commerce application. What it does not reveal is what current queries or are actually running and whether, what particular medical record they're accessing because it's, fixed. because it's fixed. But you are completely right that if you want your system to perform well, you want an epoch size that... Um, that mod models your workload. Um, we explicitly did not investigate the um, possibility of tuning the epoch size adaptively. Um, we fix it, and this models the system. If you were willing to leak more information, like um, you have a diurnal pattern where at night you have more work, fewer queries in the, the day, you could imagine tuning the epoch size that way. But you're right that this leaks more information. Okay. So this is what I'm going to say um, about Obladi, but hopefully this has given you intuition for how the idea of delayed visibility is sort of the secret source that allowed us to provide even closer to reasonable overhead. And the process, what I've tried to do is explain how this idea is what ex allowed us to extend the ORAM abstraction to support um, parallel accesses. And I've asked you to trust me that it's also what allowed us to extend the ORAM abstraction to tolerate failures. <laughs> 
And more generally, I hope that this talk has given you intuition for how uh, a client-centric approach to system design does provide some semantic benefit and can be the key to enable um, better system implementations. So in the next you know, few minutes, I just want to spend um, a little bit of time highlighting what I would like to do next. So as is probably uh, quite clear from this talk, I'm interested in issues of consistency and transaction processing. And I'm very much interested in basing myself on uh, my core interest, but looking at new applications. And specifically, there's three things I'm interested in looking at. First, I'm, I'd like to investigate broader notions of application-centric correctness, broader notions of correctness that are emerging in um, sort of new applications, like collaborative applications or numerical applications. Second, I'm interested in continuing to look at um, how to bring oblivious transaction processing closer to practicality. As you've seen, there's still a long way to go, both in terms of decentralizing the proxy and in terms of reducing the overheads further. And finally, um, I'm, more interested, I'm more broadly interested of uh, in ideas of transaction processing while minimizing trust. So just to give you uh, a flavor of what I'm talking about, I just want to um, highlight three specific ideas in each of these um, categories. So one specific um, ap idea, application that I'm interested in looking at is um, numerical applications. So these are the applications that underpin uh, many machine learning algorithms. Now there's been a large body of work on distributed systems on uh, weak consistency, where a particular object is going to be consistent within a specific error bound or a specific um, time bound or a specific <coughs> ordering of rights. Now, this has always been controversial because it's fairly hard to reason about the eight, an 87% probability that you did buy your ticket to Seattle for uh, your Microsoft interview. But in the context of uh, machine learning, however, there's two things that are um, promising. The first one is that eventual consistency always talked about being quiescent when updates stopped. Now, in a commercial application or in an uh, e-commerce application, updates never really stop. But in a machine learning system, there is a point at which updates are likely to stop. It's when you've trained the model. The second point is that there's actually been a large body of work, a large body of theoretical work, that demonstrates that machine learning algorithms, like stochastic gradient descent, are actually quite good at tolerating some amount of asynchrony. And you can actually define fairly strong theoretical bounds on what it takes to have them converge. So what I'm interested in looking at is whether or not we can leverage the theory behind weak consistency in many of the algorithms that have been designed in that context to design parameter servers that can be weakly consistent and speed up uh, model training. The second area that I want to look at is to continue bringing transaction, private transaction processing closer to practicality. And one of the biggest hurdles there is that the overheads of most oblivious systems, my system included, grows as a function of data size. Now, in the way that I've defined uh, databases, I've assumed that they look like a sequence of keys and a sequence of values, and there's a mapping between the two. That's kind of what a database looks like. But there are alternative ways to build fast database systems, one of which is by using a log, where you have a, vast, a very fast shared log that, transaction, that um, users update, and the way to recompute the state is to replay the updates. Well, it turns out that because you're replaying the updates, Log-structured databases are already oblivious. The problem is that the client playback of replaying the updates becomes a bottleneck. <coughs> so what I'm interested in looking at is can we alleviate that bottleneck in a way that is still oblivious? And is that an easier problem than providing oblivious across the data size? And the last um, problem I'm interested in looking at is how can you execute um, scalable shared computation um, between untrusted parties. So I would argue that we already know how to build uh, the storage for um, trusted scalable computation. It's called a database. And the underlying abstraction that allows these systems to scale is that they provide a partially ordered um, set of operations where conflicting operations are um, ordered, but non-conflicting operations are not. And what this allows us to do is to execute non-conflicting operations on disjoint shards and scale the system horizontally in that way. We also know how to execute um, shared computation between untrusted third parties. That's called Byzantine fault tolerance. Unfortunately, the abstraction that is provided by Byzantine fault tolerance system is that of a totally ordered log, where every operation must be processed by every replica. So there's horizontal scalability, but there's absolutely no vertical scalability. Horizontal scalability, sorry. So my question is, how can we combine the two? How can we build a system 
a Byzantine fault tolerant system that provides this abstraction of a partially ordered set of transactions. So the sort of flashy question here is, how do you do two-phase commit when you don't trust the person running the two-phase commit? So with that, I'd like to acknowledge that this is the work of many collaborators and I, uh, some of which are in this room. And um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I think this is really cool. It's very reminiscent of the Rethink the Sync work um, from OCI 10 years ago or so, where they had a similar insight, which is actually you're providing guarantees to the observer of the state, and you can do batching and dependency um, uh, monitoring to make things um, appear to be synchronous, even if in the implementation they're actually asynchronous. So how would you compare um, you know, that work with the work that you've done? Um, I think that very, very, the spirit is, is the same. So in the Blizzard work, um, one of the challenges is you have to keep metadata around to, for the user to know and to track dependencies. In the Obladi work, because you're uh, fixing the output for everyone, you don't have to worry about the metadata tracking. That's the sort of the big difference. The, we have some work in causal consistency where we end up doing something that's almost identical to Blizzard in the context of more efficient implementations of causal consistency, where we have to track more metadata at the client, but the benefit that we get is that updates become less dependent on each other, and we're less likely to um, create slowdown cascades of shards falling. The, the big thing about Obladi versus the Blizzard is that we don't have to keep additional metadata because we're fixing the output commit for everyone. Okay. Whereas I think in Blizzard, you can people become um, visible yeah, at different I, points. I, I, I don't know if Blizzard is specifically the thing that I'm thinking of. This was, um, I forget what it was. This was at Nightingale's paper, right? It was Ed and Kasha computer chat. Yeah. Okay. I, if I'm using the wrong name, we're thinking about the same paper at least. Yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. Is, is Robert a lot more formal than this? There's tons more formalism. <laughs> I think for this particular approach, the metadata and how you can compress the metadata and track dependencies is what becomes challenging. So in, in the case of file system, you have to keep track of interrupts and things like that at a lower granularity than what we had to keep track of. Right, right. I mean, speculation was also a big part of that work. Um, so is that, um, are you taking advantage of sort of the ability to roll or uh, you know roll a program forward, realize that okay it rolled forward on correct assumptions, and then in the rare case that it's incorrect, sort of roll back. Um, or can you imagine taking advantage of speculation? So in the context of the um, Obladi work, we speculate by exposing uncommitted rights early as opposed to before they have committed, which can cause a series of cascading aborts at the grand level epoch within an epoch. Um, the, in the causal consistency work that I haven't discussed, um, we take advantage of speculation in that I may be able to see a value, say, of y. And when I try to access x, the value of x that should have been the causally consistent value is not there, at which point I have to wait. But in both cases, we kind of leverage the ability. It's not quite speculation, but it's the ability to aggressively move forward in a way that we don't otherwise. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, sort of dealing with transactions as your unit of execution makes all of this a lot you know, cleaner um, and easier to deal with, too. It does introduce challenges when you look at opacity. So one thing that we did not look at is opacity, which actually places constraints on currently executing transactions. Um. So, yeah, I, like, I like a lot the general sort of spirit of like, you know, looking from the transaction side and all the early part. On the, on the ability part, I have like a very, very simple practical question if you want. Right? If I were to take uh, my SQL 5.7, put in your proxy, and just keep shipping the encrypted logs in the back, and once in a while I take a, a, a database, a backup of the entire database, and just shove it in the storage, how far a performance will be local MySQL, so it will be as good as MySQL, right? Um, how, what, what, are, what are the problems you see with like just taking your proxy approach and just like, making it as silly as, as simply running MySQL and sending out the uh, encrypted logs. So the big problem comes from the amount of information that you're having to transfer um, at every time. So okay, two things. One, um, because you can't reveal how many op operations have changed, how, many how much data has changed, every time you compute a backup, you would actually have to uh, compute the backup locally 
entirely and uh, ship it. So there's no mechanism for doing diff because the diff would leak information about the size of how many operations have changed. Now, if you're happy to pay the end cost of periodic backups, um, you're still assuming that all the information can store can be can be held exclusively at the proxy. So in our, in our system, what we do we we leverage caching and we leverage the fact that a, a, a subset of the data can actually be stored locally, but we don't make the assumption that everything can be stored locally. Because I think in the scenario that you're describing, you do make that assumption. Um, how, like in practice, how often that assumption is not valid? Like when I, when I do transactions, how, how many use cases we have where I need a petabyte of transactional store? And how many times is the transactional store is like, whatever, 10 terabyte, 5 terabyte, or 1 terabyte, or less, right? Um, like how, you see what I'm saying? Like, you know, the, the, so I think it depends. Obviously, you're advancing the state of the art. We're understanding the space better. Like, I appreciate all of it. I'm saying if, if, if I take a really industrial, very, very, very practical take on it, you know, how, how much of this is already needed or how much of this is like, you know, we're going to need in, in, in a few years? One thing that I completely would like to do is to remove this proxy so that everything can be placed directly in the cloud storage. So to getting rid of the centralized proxy in a way that can be placed directly on the cloud um, so that the hospital doesn't have to manage a, a proxy is completely the logical way forward. Um, to answer your question is it for in terms of currently, it depends on how much money you're willing to invest in the cost of the server. So in the context of um, medical records, for instance, um, the medical imagery can actually be quite large. So if you have a, a machine that has to store uh, the MRI of people, the, those particular images actually grow quite quickly. Um, so that can be one case where you do actually quickly get um, to sort of, not necessarily that many objects, but where the objects can be quite large. Um, <coughs> But you're right that in many cases, the um, you can assume that the storage will local storage is enough. What we found is that when we were looking at all of the IT um, space, medical IT space, people offload data to cloud storage not so much for scalability but for fault tolerance. Um, at which point, the logging solution that you were describing becomes interesting. But diffing the log for checkpointing is not something that we're able to find out how to do efficiently yet. Thank you. So um, on your, your second piece of future work, the sort of consistency for parameter server stuff, um, so that, uh, that I think that's really interesting because the consistency of parameters over time changes. So you know, very early on, it makes sense to provide like really strong consistency guarantees because you're sort of not sure where um, your learning is going to go, um, but then over time you want to you can relax them a little bit more and then uh, end up with the equivalent accuracy for the resulting model. Um, so, have you thought about how an application could express those consistency guarantees to a storage system? Um, you know, you, you sort of deal in the world of, of formalism. So, what would an interface to such a, a storage system actually look like? <coughs> And since it's feature work, it's fine if you don't have like a concrete answer. But having thought about it, you know. So what we what I was currently thinking about is leveraging some of the uh, work that's been done by you and Vada on continuous consistency models, where you describe consistency as a unit that has three axes. One is staleness, the other one is ordering, and one is um, um, the weights of how the weights of writes that have already happened. So how how many writes can you have diverged by? Uh, so and this provides us with three axes space. Now, in terms of how you could express consistency as like, changing over time, I think as long as you're willing to have a notion of, of you could imagine a sort of SLAs, not SLAs, but uh, constraints that say if iteration is greater than 77, I want my conit to be this, otherwise that. Um, how you would enforce this, because you now need to treat track of iterations or um, you know, time, right. this I don't know. But I can imagine having basically a small sort of, you know, a set of small statements that say, if this, then 
this conit. If that, then this conit. Yeah. I mean, another way that I've seen people try to deal with this is, is looking at the, the amount that a particular update would change the current value. Um, so in the, in the early stage, you know, it sort of classifies an update as being know, urgent. They have some term for it, right? And the, the sense of urgency changes depending on you know, the percent that it uh, modifies the existing value. So you could have sort of like content-specific rules as well. Um, now that kind of thing gets away from the formalisms um, that you've introduced because it's not so much about versions and ordering as much as distance from the current value. Um, but anyway, I think that's an interesting correction. There's been some work on actually tracking uh, uh, inconsistency in machine learning algorithms using dependency cycles, much like the ones by the idea that I was talking about. Um, and you know, if you have a cycle, that means you're more likely to have an inconsistency in tracking error that way. So I think that's a, that might also be a way to. I think the other axis you get in this is uh, there's work from uh, Marcus and Tamer others on uh, elastic machine learning, where the assumption was if I lose a node, oh well, it's just a different sample of the data I'm running with for this iteration, right? And and it turns out that they converge super well in practice. Hard to prove things about it, but like in practice, they have a very very strong result. So uh, in your setting, you can also do it in terms of saying. You know, I figure out what are the dependencies, and, if, and if the only way for me to actually move forward is to ignore one transaction, just because it's uncomfortable for me consistency-wise. You can just drop it on the ground, and and very often the machine learning model is going to chug along and, and 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 converge in the next in the next round. So I think there's a huge potential on, on uh, in this space. And there's there's some amount of semantic information that can be leveraged in specific types of machine learning, like probabilistic graph models. We can actually encode using uh, no let domain experts that. You know, we might never interact, and therefore, there's no edge between us. But there might be an edge between me and I don't know Dan and Irene, or something, or between someone else, my advisor. And that also can be something where it might make it more sense to lose an update there, because there's no dependency. Because there's, yeah. yeah. Oh, thank you.